Oh, it is. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Welcome to Spine Conference. Um, today's discussion will be on cauda equina syndrome. So yeah, none of these horses are mine, but this is just um, just to give you an idea of what a horse's tail looks like because we're going to go over it. So, <laughs> so I want to uh, I like to go over illustrative cases. So this is a this is a real case. Um, that's recent. 39-year-old woman who presented to the emergency room with bilateral sciatica and perineal anesthesia. Um, she had two weeks of symptoms, and she thought it was multiple sclerosis. Now, why she thought it was multiple sclerosis, I have no idea, but that's what she thought. Uh, she was admitted. She has past medical history of bipolar disease. She had a gastric sleeve, uh, which um, she lost 120 pounds, gained back 40. And she's on disability. She lives alone. Um, uh, she's uh, on exam. She's very alert, oriented, um, very pleasant woman. Um, she has a positive straight leg raise only on the left, mild pain down the right leg, uh, and lateral border uh, numbness. Um, but the right is basically asymptomatic, uh, except for some pain. Not totally asymptomatic, but, but mostly. So any questions about the history so far? Okay, so now this um, this, the emergency room um, correctly, okay, correctly picked this up as a serious, serious problem if there's perineal anesthesia. And most people, when they have perineal anesthesia, they think it's something very bad or serious or they don't, most people do not ignore it. Um, but many people don't know what it means. Um, so she had an emergency MRI in the uh, um, when she was admitted. And uh, Aaron, show everyone what you see here with your pointer. Yeah, so this is a sagittal cut of the lumbar spine, and you can see a very large L5-S1 disc herniation uh, into the th uh, into the spinal canal. There's both T1, T2 weighted images. And this is the, what do you think? Uh, show everyone um, the findings here at L3, L4, L4, L5. Yeah, La lateral recess is slightly stenotic, right? Um, come a little closer so you can so they can hear the microphone. And now L five S one, what do you see? Maybe maybe at L five S one, what do you not see? There's no spinal canal, right? It's all black. So go backwards. You see, everyone can see the spinal canal and the little dots, the nerve roots. Um, you can see them, but at L five S one, you don't see any nerve roots at all. And I apologize about the blurriness of the MRI. What happened is that when she was in the scanner, she was moving because she was in pain. So that's why the pictures aren't so clear. And so just so you get an idea, I, I, uh, I marked out the spinal canal here where it should be. And, and the only thing you can see is the right S1 nerve root. That's the only thing you can see. E everything else is you can't see it at all. And just so you understand what it should look like, this is what it should look like. You see the spinal canal here, and you see the individual nerve roots. And that's that's actually kind of a big, it's a big disc herniation there, yeah. uh, left L5-S1 disc herniation. So it's the same problem that this patient has, and that's a pretty big one. So you can imagine, Aaron, how would you describe this disc herniation? If this one, would you agree this one's big? That one's, that one's big, big. Yeah. Well, would you? How would you describe this? It, it completely obliter nearly obliterate completely obliterates the spinal canal maybe 80 percent the other thing we think is uh 80 uh spinal uh, um, canal like how much what percentage of spinal <laughs> canal is gone by 80 percent i would say um yeah so if this one's huge good morning dr david if this one's huge i would say this one's uh this one's enormous you know so so uh david just to bring you up to speed this is a um 39 year old woman Come in, 39-year-old woman with bilateral sciatica, perineal numbness, and um, the MRI scan shows uh, a, a massive L5-S1 disc herniation. Good morning, Kirsten. Uh, and this is normal. So, um, why why wasn't why wasn't this patient have complete loss of all bowel bladder control and dense numbness from a disc herniation that's this big? Why? Why is that? No, because all of them. No, all of them are involved. 
all of them. I mean, you saw that every single that nerves are completely compressed there. Huh? That's a hint right there. Why? What, what is that? What? What does that show? That that's a weight on my mat at home, and I left it there for about three weeks. So, wh how would you describe the pressure from it's creep? So creep is a slow deformation from pressure over time, and and the the weight caused creep on the mat there. So what happened is is in your mind's eye that took a long time to happen. That woman's disc herniation was slowly creeping out, slowly, 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 and just like the frog that uh, doesn't jump out of a boiling pot of water, you you don't realize it's terrible until it's too late. So th this was a slow process, and that's why she still has bowel and bladder function. It was slow. And the nerves can accommodate that. So another example is a car accident. Uh, you know, in shock trauma, when you have a, a, a an acute, very fast timing uh, loss of spinal canal, um, patient's paralyzed. But if, like, for example, you know, the patient we did yesterday, the spinal cord is flat as a pancake. If it happens over a slow period of time, the patient does not get paralyzed. So it's the it's the amount of time that the pressure occurs on the nerve roots. So that, that is why this woman does not have a complete quadriquina syndrome. She's just numb. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So th that that's a um, slow progressive, yeah. So quadriquina. So what is quadriquina? The quadriquina means, in Latin, horse's tail. And the reason why they call it horse's tail is because it does look like a horse's tail on the right. If you remove all the bony elements, the, uh, the the inferior third of the spine, there's no spinal cord after L1, it's all just nerve roots. And if you look at it, all the nerve roots all together, it looks like a horse's tail. Uh, and it's basically the nerve roots from L1 to S5. And again, if you guys have any questions, just interrupt me. So what is cauda equina syndrome? Cauda equina syndrome is a uh, constellation of signs and symptoms. So those signs and symptoms are pain. So the pain is either low back pain, bilateral sciatica pain, bilateral buttock pain, or lower paternity pain, saddle anesthesia, and I'll show you what I mean by that, and sacral nerve root dysfunction. So <clears throat> the sacrum, the lower sacral segments, not S1, the lower sacral segments innervate the bowel and bladder control. And we'll get into that in more detail. Um, now, just to, just to remember, Cardiquina syndrome was not described by God. Cardiquina syndrome, I'm being a little silly here, but was described by humans, and we use this syndrome to help other humans. So it's fallible. It's not perfect, but it's a tool that we use to understand when somebody has a serious problem. Uh, so, so like when a limb goes weak, we know it right away. Like somebody like uh, Tony, he can tell you that when he bench presses 300 pounds, his right arm feels a little bit weak. And that's a very, very subtle weakness that he knows immediately on the limb. And just like, uh, so that's like weightlifters can tell very, very quickly they have a problem. Um, and then normal people can tell they're getting weak too because you just can't lift something heavy like a gallon of milk and you can test it. The problem with the bowel and bladder is there's no way for us to know how strong it is because we don't realize there's a problem until basically you fall off a cliff. So that's the problem with bowel and bladder control. So on the floor, if you had a bladder scanner like this image, you can know that you're bladder is really big before you feel the sensation to urinate and then when you urinate and then after you urinate you see how much urine comes out so with a bladder scanner we could know but we don't bladder scan everybody i mean that comes through the door so that's the that's the main problem with uh, bowel and bladder control and sacral nerve root dysfunction we can't we can't figure it out we can't uh, clinically understand it until the problem is too late can be yes yeah, so digital rectal exam is definitely part of the workup to, to see. And we'll, we'll go over that in a second. And so, and physical, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can easily feel the bladder. Yeah, you can easily feel, in a thin person, you can completely feel the bladder. Yeah. And uh, and the perineal and the perineal exam people don't do, and I don't really do it, but I ask because like you have normal perineal. I mean, people don't even ask because it's embarrassing, because um, it's you know your sexual area where you go to the bathroom. But I ask, do you have any problems in sensation around your 
uh, mm -hmm. area, general area. And if they do, they'll tell you, but they won't offer that information to you sometimes. So that should be part of the history. So saddle anesthesia, what is saddle anesthesia? Let's say you paint that saddle with paint and you jump, you, you jump on it and then you come off the saddle and you look where the paint is. That is what the people are numb. So you can imagine the area when you sit on a saddle, if it got, if it got painted, that's where uh, people get numb with sacral nerve root dysfunction. So how about um, what Alan was saying, how about the rectal exam? So the rectal exam um, is, uh, is in mostly is three parts for the spine. Uh, you wanna test the internal, so you wanna look for the internal sphincter, you wanna look for the external sphincter, and you wanna look for sensation. And the, and the other most important point is uh, when you do it, you have to, you have to uh, be uh, slow. So it's not painful and point to the umbilicus. Those are the keys to the rectal exam. So, so when you first put your finger in the rectum, you ask, can you feel this? Does it feel like the rest of your body? And they will know if it's numb or not. And so that's, that's the sensory is number one. Then as you insert your finger into the, uh, into the patient's anus, you first feel the, um, uh, the external sphincter, which is usually not firing at the time. And then as you go deeper, you feel the internal sphincter, which is a voluntary, which is an involuntary sphincter. The internal sphincter is what is an extension of the colon, which basically basically keeps the feces from coming out all the time, and it's always firing involuntarily. The external sphincter is what we can control ourselves, this striated muscle, and so like you feel, I mean, people feel like the feces is about to come out, and they can squeeze and hold it so they can until they get to the bathroom or whatnot. So those are the two different aspects. So when you finally put your finger and you can feel the internal sphincter tongue. And then once your finger is in, you ask, squeeze down on my finger, um, like you're holding in a bowel movement. And then, then you can feel the external sphincter. So those are the two parts of the test. So you can tell how far gone they are. So in a, in a, in a case of complete uh, sacral like paralysis, they have nothing. You, you put the finger in, they don't feel a thing. And you put your finger in, there's, there's nothing squeezing on your finger at all, zero. The problem with di digital rectal exam is that it's not a very good test. Like it, um, it, it doesn't work so well. Like you miss things. Uh, you, uh, you, it's, it's not. There's not much uh, inner, uh, inner observer um, reliability. So when you have five doctors, they all say something different. So, but it is a test. Um, so we went over that, the muscle layers of the voluntary contracting. The uh, external sphincter gives you about 30% of the resting tone. And it's innervated by S2, S3, and S4. And uh, just some more, I won't get into this. So uh, urinary symptoms. So just so you know, um, urinary symptoms can be very different. Uh, okay, some people say, I can't, I can't, I don't realize when I have to pee. And then when I pee, I, I lose it. Or they say, I, when I have to pee, it's all of a sudden extreme, and then I have to really go quickly. So they don't feel the sensation of the bladder getting bigger. So usually, I think it's around three or 400 cc's, you realize your bladder is full, and you have to go to the bathroom, and you, kind of, you can still hold it. But these people don't feel that at all. That's one sensation that, that people have told me. Another one is obviously urinary retention is that they just can't go, and they have a huge bladder, and it really hurts. And they go to the ER, and they get catheterized. Those people are kind of far gone. Then um, I've had two cases where the women said to me when they urinate, only women, when they urinate, the urine goes down their thigh. So it's some kind of external uh, urinary sphincter uh, disorder. And they didn't know why that was. And I knew immediately what it was. And um, you know, I knew that was a serious, I tell them it's a very, very serious problem. That we're, it's just at the very onset. And then, um, and then overflow incontinence when... Um, People lose it when the bladder is not working, and then it's, it's, you know, the bladder, instead of just bursting into the abdomen, it just overrides the uh, external sphincter. So it can present all sorts of different ways, and it's not classic. Uh, usually it's not classic. It's, it's unusual. Any questions about urine? So the bladder is innervated. These are all the innervations. Um, on the left are the parasympathetics, S2, S3, S4. On the right are the sympathetics. And on the bottom are the somatics, which are to the sphincter and to the bladder, S2, S3, and S4. So the bladder is made up, of course, of the, uh, of the bladder itself and then also the external sphincter. Okay, so any questions about caudoquina syndrome?
bowel and bladder control sensation. Okay, so these are just a few articles I want to go over. This this is I think this is the best article, uh, probably because my friend wrote it when he was a uh, Hopkins fellow, and that's him, Nick Ahn, and he's now he's a spine surgeon in the Cleveland, but he wrote this when he was a fellow at 2000 at Johns Hopkins, and it was a meta analysis of 322 patients with quadriquina syndrome. So he looked at all the all the articles in the world, and he found articles that he felt are relevant, and he um, uh, basically summarized the findings. And he found the findings were people with chronic low back pain got worse bowel and bladder loss. People with preoperative bowel dysfunction also had worse urinary dysfunction. Older people had worse sexual function. So sexual dysfunction because their perineum is numb. So they, uh, the, you know, they have the, the sex doesn't work very well when you're numb. And then the most important finding I think was, um, uh, there was no difference between less than 24 hours and 24 to 48 hours of onset of symptoms. So let's say you, uh, you have a numb perineum and you can't pee. You don't, this study showed there's no added benefit if you take them like, immediately to surgery, less than 24 hours versus less than 48 hours. So you basically have 24 hours usually. Usually the patient comes in within 24 hours of the onset. So you have another 24 hours to get to the surgery. It doesn't make a difference as far as recovery. That, that's what his study showed. Also, um, there was a big difference if you did the surgery um, before 48 hours versus after 48 hours. So those patients who had surgery after 48 hours did a lot worse. So does everyone understand that? So it's kind of like this is where basically the standard of care legally and medically is about 48 hours from this study, basically. This is a Spine 2000, and it's um, it's June 15th, 2000. It's Spine. It's just the it's not called Journal of Spine. It's just called Spine. It's a journal. Yeah, I can um, actually I don't have it, but you can we can get it. Sherry can get it for you. Sherry here at medical staff. She's awesome. So this is this is from an article. This is from a legal journal actually. Um, because the reason is this is a, the average uh, medical payout for the, this is at five hundred thousand dollars. So it's a, it's a, because people are seriously dysfunctional if they lose their battle bladder control, and most of the people that lose their battle bladder control do not go back to work. Like I think only like ten percent of people go back to work, and those people are usually I think work from home. Um, so it, it causes a serious social problem for these people, and it's just symptoms are either battle bladder dysfunction, bilateral sciatica. Uh, motor deficits, perineal numbness, back pain. So this is another, um, this is an article on chordomas that I pulled because you may say, what's a chordoma? What the, what does that have to do with quadriquina syndrome? So sacral chordomas are a, um, a cancer, a slow progressive cancer that affects the sacrum. And if you, go on, Doug, if you take out the entire sac the entire chordoma, it never comes back. So a chordoma should be removed with margins, and they commonly occur in the sacrum. So my whole point is like these tumor surgeons, they remove all the sacral nerve roots on purpose um, because if they don't, the patient will die from cancer. So the patient knows going into the surgery that they may lose their bowel and bladder function, but the other option is you just, you don't remove the cancer, which eventually will kill you. So they have a, a vast experience of what, what nerves really go to bowel and bladder? So they found that, I know this is a complicated slide, but if you remove all the nerve roots, both sides, everybody loses their bowel and bladder control. So that's kind of obvious. If you remove bilaterally S2 to S5, again, everyone loses their <laughs> bowel and bladder control. If you remove um, both sides, bilateral S3 to S5, so in, the, in those patients, 60% lost their bowel and bladder control bowel control, 75 lost their bladder control. So most of the people lost their bowel and bladder control if you remove bilateral S3 to S5. And then if you just remove S4 to S5 bilaterally, 0% lost their bowel control and 40% lost their bladder control. And I think, and unilateral S3 was a third. And I think clinically that makes the most sense because usually people have bla more bladder problems than they have bowel problems if they're a mild case. So I just thought that was interesting. Like which which specific which nerve roots go? 
One, two, three, four, five. What yeah, it does. It does. That's a phylum terminale. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's got six. The sixth one, I don't think, goes to anything. Okay, so this is the most recent article for standard of care for standard of care for aquatic classrooms that I can find doing a PubMed search, and this was uh, from the UK uh, and was um, British Journal of Neurosurgery, 2016, and um, he classified it as people at risk, and the people at risk for aquatic aquatic syndrome are bilateral radiculopathy. Both legs have symptoms. People that are incomplete have some bladder control. And R stands for retention. You have urinary retention. People who are urinary retention are have a serious problem. And C is for complete loss of bowel bladder control. So this is him, Nicholas Pod. He's from Newcastle upon time. Do you know where that is? Newcastle? Really? That's where he's from. So he he um Dr. Todd broke it up into four categories. Of quadriquinus syndrome, people who are people suspicious quadriquinus syndrome, incomplete injury, retention, which is more serious, and then complete loss. And he found that if you get to surgery less than 24 hours, 89% have a normal bladder. Less than 48 hours, 79% normal bladder. And that's that's pretty close to being the same, which is the same as the on study. Greater than 48 hours, 44% normal bladder. So there's a big jump if you go more than two days. So there's a couple other things his meta-analysis found is that an emergency MRI is critical for any time you're suspicious and bilateral sciatica is suspicious. So basically, and this is not for orthopedic surgeons because we know this more than it's more for ER doctors or family doctors. If someone has bilateral sciatica, it's uh, there's a chance it could it'd be a quadriquinus syndrome about to happen. And then the other thing he found is that incomplete bladder dysfunction patients are true emergencies. And the reason is these are the people that we can help the most. And these are the people that do the best. So unfortunately, they're very mild symptoms. So the take home from this uh, article, review article, is that you have to take any kind of, about, any kind of usually it's bladder, any kind of bladder problem or perineal anesthesia very, very, very seriously. Like you get an emergency MRI, and if the MRI shows a big disc, you do basically emergency surgery. And then the other question he has is like, when do you do the operation? Do you do, do, you do the operation at one o'clock in the morning? So the, his point is that out of hour surgery carry increased morbidity and mortality risks. So, you know, I, I hate operating at one or two in the morning. I mean, I'm, I'm tired. Uh, I'm not at my best. I know the time is critical. Right, right. That's, that's, that's the issue with these people. He said he went into that. He went into that. Is that it depends who does the case? Is it the consulting surgeon? Is it the uh, house surgeon? Yeah. And how quickly do you go? And so, but it's definitely true that in the middle of the night you don't do as good of a job as you do at six in the morning. Hours, you know, I'm right. Huh? Yeah, it is nice, cool bridge. bridge. I've never been to Newcastle. Though. Yeah, British, yes, they're, they're, they're smart people. It's a big ship town, Newcastle. Okay, this is the last article I'm going to go over. This is, um, this is from uh, Shanghai, China. And um, it's the assessment of quad aquatic syndrome and um, the signs and symptoms that lead up to it. And basically, um, early symptoms are bilateral lower extremity motor sensory abnormalities and incomplete retention of urine. So basically, <laughs> this is a great, I, I like this, it's, a, it's, it's funny. It's basically 222 people that had caught aquatic syndrome and where they started and how the, how the symptoms went. You can see um, by, on the top left going down, the most common uh, complaint was bilateral lower extremity pain. And then paresthesias, and then motor loss, sciatica. And then from there, they went on to bladder dysfunction, uh, reduction of uh, bladder function, reduction of bowel function, and then bowel dysfunction. So you see the, the last thing that these people get is bowel dysfunction. 
and bladder dysfunction occurs before bowel dysfunction. So you should not be looking for bowel dysfunction. If, you, if you're looking for bowel dysfunction, it's over. So there's a complete neurological injury. And the, 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 most, the one that happens first usually is reduction of bladder function. Uh, and perineal anesthesia is, is usually first before bladder dysfunction, but not all the time. So perineal anesthesia is probably more sensitive uh, sign than uh, bladder dysfunction. And perineal anesthesia is very easy to ascertain. You can ask or you know examine somebody, but like I said before, bladder is a is a problem. So just I just wanted to give you guys my anecdotal evidence is that woman that I did the surgery. So that let's go back to that woman that I did. She um she we did her surgery. Um, she was two weeks, and but her bladder function was not bad. It, it was pretty normal. She felt so. We did her the next day. I mean, she came in like at eight o'clock at night. We did her the next day. And um, she had complete improvement. Everything went away. Complete uh, return of all of her anal uh, numbness and perineal numbness. The way she described it is there was an eight inch area around her anus and her vagina that were completely numb. And after the surgery, she said it's totally normal. Uh, so she was a home run really. And I mean, the other cases I've had is the, I think two women that told me they're urinary, they, they, they peed down their thigh, that completely resolved, perineal mm -hmm. anesthesia resolved. I had one complete quadriplanar syndrome when I first started practicing in like 99, was from an abscess in a diocese patient, L5S1. And he did improve dramatically, but it took six months. And he had a complete loss. He says now it's just some loss of bowel and bladder, but mild. Um, so this is, this is my anecdotal evidence. I think I think it's a couple. Yeah, recovery is usually quick. Yeah, if it's if so, I, I'm I'm not sure. These are meta analysis, so uh, it, it all varied, but but usually it's quick. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. He had a hematoma of what? Why did he, why did he bleed into his spinal canal? Was he on blood thinners or something? No, no. Just, huh? I, you know, you're spontaneous. It. Yeah, that's a spontaneous epidural hematomas do occur, but I usually see it in people on blood thinners, like Coumadin mm -hmm. and. I've seen that. I've seen in the neck. I saw a woman, she, she was driving to work, and she had a spontaneous cervical epidural hematoma. And uh, she was lost function of her arms and legs. She, I think she was on Plavix or something. It's very scary. Yeah, very scary. And But it, like you said, if it happens in the lumbar spine, it can just present as quadriclinic syndrome. So any, any other questions at all? Uh, the ER docs, the, the ER docs are pretty good about diagnosing this. So they know to get an emergency MRI. They're very sensitive to it. Um, I have not found them. I mean, I'm talking about my ER because that's the only ER I cover. I have found them do a very good job about that. And, and the, and the, uh, the uh, problem of getting an emergency MRI has gone away. They basically the ER techs come in for this. No, there's no question, nothing, and um, and they get the MRI immediately. So, I think our MRIs, our ER has gotten a lot better too in the last five, five or five years, five six years with uh, bringing on the Maryland people. Well, now it is though. Yeah. So that's the whole point of of learning is uh, is very very. Uh, uh, High suspicion. Uh, whenever when you see these people, do they have cardiac quina syndrome or, or sacral? I I used to I call it usually sacral nerve root dysfunction because, like I said, cardiac quina syndrome. At that point, when people lose their bowel and bladder control, you're it's over. Like you have a serious injury already, so you want to catch it early. So the early cases are big disc herniations, which you need an MRI to know that. So very very early MRI is very important. And perineal anesthesia. Any question about any kind of perineal anesthesia? MRI immediately and think about doing the surgery immediately. 
Say again? What? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Clinically, people do not notice the bowel and bladder mild dysfunction but they know the perineal anesthesia right away because the perineum is a very sensitive area. I mean, it's highly innervated. So you know something's wrong. And they don't tell you because um, they're embarrassed. Um, but they know, they know immediately that, they, the, you know, part of their perineum is numb. So, and the other thing is I asked, I asked, um, Costway presented this in 2000 when I was a resident. Um, and uh, at Grand Rounds, and I asked, I stood up and I said, have you ever seen a case of quadriquinus syndrome without perineal numbness, ever? He said, no, I, I cannot recall. And same for me. I've never, I've never had a case, seen a case of uh, quadriquinus syndrome without some element of numbness. So, and, and, that, and that is born true by that China study, which most of the people got perineal numbness before they got dysfunction. So sensory, sensory is affected first. Which is good because we can ask sensory. Right, right, right. Diabetes, yeah, diabetes is another serious problem. Yeah, and they don't notice it as much, right? Yeah, so any patients with diabetes, I guess you can't you can't uh, rely on numbness, because yeah, and and psychiatric illness people they're just they're just mentally they're not they're not strong enough to you know seek attention or or realize it's a problem um i mean you know sick people that's the people we take care of and we don't take care of i tell the air all the time we don't take care of like strong strong normal people we take care of sick people that's what we do as doctors and that's, we don't see we don't see the strong people yeah 15 medications yeah. Yeah, and now that medicine's really good, there's a lot of those people around. There's very delicate, very delicate people. Okay, so any other questions about quadriquinus syndrome? Duh. Came at the end. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good topic. To, and I learned a lot just from reading. Uh, yeah, reading these uh, last two articles. I mean, they were they were good. And the other interesting thing is everything's on YouTube. It's like you can you can find Dr. Todd gave a lecture on YouTube. So so I, I search everything on YouTube now. The the she had a her disc was her L five S one disc was. Um, decrease dramatically. Basically, the whole disc is in the spinal canal. See the bottom disc? The bottom disc is gone. It's because the whole thing's in the spinal canal. See that? I mean, she... Spurring? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for 39... Nah. Yeah. It's... Mild, yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, not bad. For 39, not bad. The, the bottom disc is definitely uh, gone. One person I saw with an Olympic rower had quadriquinus syndrome? Yeah. And her presenting symptoms were like simple. Like, wow. If you've never seen these, these people are just like, you know, they're working out like eight hours a day or something. It's just monstrous. And they do a tremendous amount of, you know, weights in, in an unusual position. Rowing or a rowing machine, you know, puts a tremendous amount of. Did she have done this? Lower. You know, I don't recall. I, I thought her, her biggest problem was she couldn't pee. You know, uh -huh. It's almost like uh, she's going to explode or something. Uh -huh. and, and my point was a lot of these, like, super athletes, if you've ever seen them, like bikers and rowers, they're sort of so used to, like, having. They're different organisms. Pain or numbness, yeah. you know, like bikers. You know, I've seen a couple of, you know, world class bikers. They're in the saddle. They. You know, they've got 
you know, when you start rowing in the, in the beginning of the year, you get calluses on your butt or your, or your, um, your ischial tuberosity. So some of these people, I think that numbness might be a, not, not usual for someone that's used to um, really working out. They ignore, hard. yeah, they ignore. Yeah, symptoms. like that was supposedly Lance Armstrong's presenting symptom. You know, he had, he just attributed his testicular cancer to too many hours in the saddle, you mm -hmm. know. So, uh, mm -hmm. but that was clearly, you know, that was a, that was a girl in her 20s, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's really, you can't even believe how hard they work out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever see an Olympic athlete I mean, like, in my entire life with my practice. Uh, you know, you'd be surprised. <laughs> like the, the club I belong to in Philadelphia, we've got a couple of guys every year. And, uh, you know, these guys have 13 workouts a week. Yeah. They're working out. They they take a half a day off. Two I mean, days, it's, yeah. It's just incredible the amount of, uh, I mean, you know, that's just a run to the mill. Yeah. Well, Philadelphia's a big city. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're a small town. Right. All right, any other questions, guys? All right, thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.